Okay, welcome back. Um, so, a uh, quick administrative thing before we get into the, uh, the actual content. Um, homework, which is at seven or eight. What are you working on now? You're working on six now. Okay, so, so homework seven is out. Um, and it's due uh, Tuesday after break. Not because I expect you to work on it over break, but because break is week long and you can take that week off. But um, start um, start this week before you leave. Um, this is the last homework um, before midterm two. Um, which will be uh, the, the Tuesday after Tuesday, about after break. Um, I think this is April 4th, right? 4th ish. Um, so, once again, we, um, for, for midterm one, we had homework 0, 1, 2, and 3 leading up to uh, the exam with four questions. Now we've had homework 4, 5, 6, and 7 leading up to another exam with four questions. Um, that should give you a rough idea of the, 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 the balance of the material. I suspect just based on the availability of good questions, the balance of the exam may tilt a little bit more toward flows than randomized algorithms. Um, uh, but that's basically the content of the exam. Um, so, yes, believe it or not, you know, spring break is coming, which means we're more than halfway through the semester. We're about halfway through the third quarter of the, the third chunk of the course. Um, and so it's time for another exam. Um, I think that's actually all the administrative stuff I need to say at this point. OK. So starting um, last week, uh, we started, or I guess, you know, a week and a half ago, we, we started talking about this pair of, of prototypical graph problems called maximum flows and, and, and minimum cuts. Um, and in, uh, in Thursday's lecture, we started talking about some applications of max flows and min cuts that started out still being relatively abstract. Um, what I want to talk about today are, hopefully if there's time, three more different applications, two of which will um, at least will be uh, relatively concrete um, in the sense that you might actually imagine doing something like this in the real world. Uh, the third one is a little bit more abstract, but will require um, a couple more steps and give you some idea of you know, the freedom that we have to play around with these, with these tools. Okay. So the first problem that I want to talk about um, has to do with baseball.
Okay, so um, these are the, um, I believe, the American League standings in uh, sometime in January of 19, uh, August of 1996. Um, uh, for, you know, one of the clusters of, of, of baseball teams in the American League. The five teams, um, these are the records. 75 games won by the New York Yankees, uh, 49 games won by the Detroit Tigers. Um, the Yankees had 28 games left to play in the regular season. Detroit um, had 27. And the schedule of upcoming games um, for the rest of the regular season is already known in advance. These things are planned out in a, in a secret meeting at the Vatican years in advance. So we know, for example, that Detroit is going to play um, New York three more times. If you look at this matrix carefully, you'll notice that it's not true. And um, the question at this point is, is it possible for Detroit to come out ahead better than everyone else? Um, and so I do a little bit of math here. I say, okay, look, Detroit has already won 49 games, and, and Detroit has 27 games left. That means, in principle, Detroit could end the season having won 76 games. Now, if I look at the other teams, none of them have won 76 games. And so you might conclude at this point that it is possible for Detroit to win the pennant and go into the World Series. But um, in fact, it's not possible for Detroit to win. And the argument goes something like this. In order for Detroit to win, New York has to lose every other game. Right? Or maybe, let, let's say, we want Detroit to win without any, without any, you know, without any ties, unambiguously. So that means New York cannot win any of its other games. Um, in particular, New York cannot win any of its eight games against Boston. So Boston has to win at least eight games, meaning Boston will end the season with 77 games. So uh, the only way to keep Boston from winning at least 76 is for New York to win at least. In fact, if New York only wins one game, that means Boston still ends with 76. So either New York or Boston can, can, it can beat Detroit. There's no way that Detroit can win the pass. Okay. Um, these are the actual real, honest to God, real life statistics, by the way. Um, if there's one thing that baseball fans are good at, it is collecting data. Um, it is amazing how much data is generated by a baseball game. Um, in part because there, uh, you know, there are a few, you know, 30,000 people sitting in the stands, and another fifty about five hundred thousand people watching at home, and at least ten percent of them have a clipboard, and they're taking down every last. Thing. Oh, the, the 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 first baseman started with their left foot this time. Okay, let's move that down. Um, uh, uh, so there's all sorts of wonderful statistics about, you know how good the particular batter is against left-handed pitchers in away games on Tuesday. Um, so they, they're really completely obsessive about this, about this data. Um, so it's interesting that actually an, an interesting algorithmic question comes out of it, which is, in general, given not just, you know, in this case, there's only a constant amount of data on the screen. And so the worst possible brute force algorithm runs in constant time. But you can imagine a, a generalization of this where you've got some number n teams, each of which has you know, built up a win-loss record so far, and each of which we know the, the, the future schedule of games. Um, is any team mathematically eliminated? Okay. Um, it's not at all obvious what, you know, at, at first glance, what kind of problem this is, aside from the fact that you're hearing about it in a lecture about applications of maximum flow. Okay. Um, there's no 
graph, no, well, you can see there's a graph, but <laughs> you can't see what the graph is. There's, there's no graph in the input. It's not immediately clear what the graph might be. Um, so uh, the way that I want to think about approaching this problem is um, let's try you know, following the logic that we followed in the example showing that, you know, arguing that Detroit can't win. But Detroit is mathematically eliminated. Um, so the question is, um, uh, can team N win first place? Okay. Um, and for the inputs, let's imagine that I have for each team, um, I have uh, the number of games they've won so far. The number of games they've, they've lost already doesn't matter. The only the, the winning condition is just um, who has won the most games at the end of the season. Um, and then I'm going to have a, a, a two-dimensional array that essentially tracks uh, the number of games left for every pair of teams. So it'll be zero down the diagonal and it will be symmetric, just like we would see in the example up here. Okay. So the first idea is to say, all right, let's assume for the sake of argument that team N, the, the last team in this list, so say I've, I've, I've sorted the teams so that this array W is in decreasing order just for convenience. Um, let's just assume that team N wins all of its remaining games. Okay. So assume uh, team N wins uh, all of its remaining games. And how many remaining games does it have? Well, this is the sum over I less than N of G I N games. Um, Let's, in general, define R sub i to be the sum, the total number of, of remaining games for team i. Okay. So this is actually what um, I've written in this example at, in the column that's called left. That's, that's R sub i. It's derived from the, the two-dimensional array on the right. Um, but just for convenience, it's, it's easy to, easier to think about it this way. Okay? Now, um, the, the, the question that we need to ask then is, is it possible for... Um, every team i less than n to end with less than. Well, um, the number of games that team i will win altogether is the number of games they won already plus the number of games that team n has left, left to play um, um, and so uh, what it means for team N to be, you know, not, let's say, um, I, I just, I want it to be mathematically eliminated, so um, as long as, you know, it's possible to at least tie for first place, I'm going to say that that the, the, the team is not eliminated, okay? So the only way that, that team N can stay in the race, even if it wins all of its games, is that the number of games at the end of the season won by any other team is at most the number of teams won by, game N, by team N at the end of the season, okay? Um, which is the same as saying uh, wins at most w of n plus 
R of n minus the number of wins is, uh, games so far, more games. Okay? So I want to know whether it's possible for all of the other games to play out, assuming that Team N wins every remaining game, so that the total number of wins of all future games by Team I is at most this quantity. The total number of, of games that Team N will win by the end of the season minus the total number of games that Team I has won already. Okay? Um, so, this starts to look a little bit like. Um, And as soon as you see this at most in the, in the reformulation of the problem, it starts to look possibly like a kind of capacity constraint. Okay. I have some resource that I want to distribute among the teams, namely wins. But I want to know if it's possible to do it in a way that I can distribute all of that resource um, in a way that each team has, a, has an upper bound on how much of that resource it can receive. Okay. So, um, another way of, of, of saying that is uh, this is really a kind of assignment problem. Um, right, when you, when you say, is it possible for every team to end, end, the, end the season with somebody wins, what we really mean is, is it possible that for game one, we assign a winner, and for game two, we assign a winner, and for game 79, we assign a winner so that we get this outcome? Right? So we're trying to assign uh, a winning team to each game. And as soon as you see the word assign, what should pop into your head is there's probably a bipartite graph. You know, the assignment problem, generally you have several different sets of vertices. Um, in the example that we saw at the end of the class on Thursday, we had, um, what was it, Pro program committee members and papers. Here we have two different kinds of resources. Um, one of them is teams, and the other one is games. And we want to assign every game to a team, declaring that team to be its winner. Every game is only going to be assigned to one team, because only one team can win. Um, um, and I have some resource constraints that include every game getting played, meaning every, every game gets assigned to somebody. But on the other hand, I have capacity constraints on the teams. Okay. So um, the way that I'm going to organize this, right, I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit by, um, uh, you know, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and take the bipartite graph and I'm going to add the, the, the source and target edges because that's what you do when you have an assignment problem. You, you build the bipartite graph that here on the left you have all of the games that are left to play. Now, there, there are a couple of different ways we could have approached this. One is to say there are, th are eight games left between New York and Boston. We'll give each one of those its own node and say, this is New York-Boston game one, this is New York-Boston game two, this is the down to New York-Boston game eight. And then each of those things needs um, you know, to be assigned to exactly one winner on the, on the right. Over here on the right, I have the teams, not including Detroit, because I've already assumed that Detroit has won all of its, all of its future games. On the left, connecting to the source, I have capacity constraints. Um, and what I'm aiming for, you know, when, I'm, when I think about an assignment, is the assignment's going to be modeled as a flow through the graph. And if I decompose that flow into individual paths, each carrying one unit of flow, each of those one unit flows corresponds to, for example, a single game played between New York and Baltimore that Baltimore wins. Okay? 
Um, and so I'm going to add, I'm going to put a, a capacity, an upper bound of eight on this edge, saying I need to, I can only assign games that New York and Boston are actually going to play, and there are eight of those. So I can assign at most eight games. But then the goal eventually is going to be, can I assign all of the games? So when I compute a maximum flow through this graph, the question is going to be, can I saturate all of these outgoing edges? Right. Are all of these edges going to be full in the final flow that I compute? Yes? Are all the middle edges the same? Yes, there, there's actually no point in putting additional capacities on the middle edges because I haven't talked about the, the, the capacity constraints on the right yet, but um, uh, the con constraints on the left and the right are sufficient to constrain the problem. Yeah. Okay. What I've put over here on the, on the right is um, this quantity here. This is the, the number of games that New York could still win without um, you know, overwhelming Detroit completely. And if, I, if I look back at the original stats, if Detroit wins all of its games, it ends the season with 76 wins, which means if, if we want New York not to completely beat Detroit, they're allowed to win only one more game. And um, which is, you know, I just calculated it from the, from the data up there. Um, and these are the, the, New York is allowed to win only one more game, Baltimore is allowed to win at most five, Boston is allowed to win at most seven, Toronto is allowed to win at most 13. And at this point, um, right, all of these edges in the middle, uh, I'm going to give infinite capacities because there's no, no other constraints that I need to worry about. At this point, I have a graph um, with integer capacities, and so I know that I can compute an integer maximum flow. Um, and in particular, that maximum flow um, is also going to generate um, a minimum cut. And the question is whether um, all these edges are saturated or not. Well, the total capacity of these edges is 27. So the question is whether there is a flow from S to T that has value 27. If the maximum flow has value less than 27, then there's no way I can assign all the all games. And it's not possible by the next flow cut theorem for there, be to, for there to be a flow value a flow with value greater than 27. Um, on the other hand, if I look at this side, the total amount of flow um, going into T is only 26. Therefore, Detroit is mathematically eliminated. Now, in this particular example, the, the, the proof didn't require computing the flow at all. In this particular example, I just said, I need 27 units of flow coming out of S, but I have only 26 units of capacity going into T, therefore mathematically eliminated. But in general, that's not going to happen. It is possible that I have enough capacity coming into T, but nevertheless, because of the connections between the vertices in the middle, there may be another cut that contains um, some edges on the left and some edges on the right that, that is smaller than the total capacity coming out of this. Right. Now, this is a bit tricky for this example. Any cut that, that kind of goes through the middle like this um, is going to have um, actually infinite capacity. But that isn't always going to be the case. Um, it might be, for example, that Baltimore is only going to play Toronto in the future. Sorry, I should, uh, if, if say Baltimore only played Toronto, um, I might be able to draw a cut like this. This isn't a good cut because it, it's got a, an infinite capacity edge coming out of it. But if say, um, uh, there were, you know, I might be able to draw in general a line like this 
that has no edges crossing crossing through it. Um, and then I have a more interesting um, a more interesting graph than this this particular example, where I would actually have to compute the maximum flow. Right. Um, the number of vertices in this graph is equal to well, it's at most n squared, where n is the number of teams, um, because uh, it could be for every pair of teams, I have at least one game. Um, the number of edges is also at most n squared, because every one of these possibly n squared um, game vertices has exactly one edge coming in and exactly two edges coming out. Um, and the only other edges in the graph are these n edges, n minus one edges over here. Um, and so that means that the running time of the algorithm is going to be v times z, which is um, n to the fourth. Um, if I use, for example, um, Orland's algorithm to compute the flow. n to the fourth is not great. Um, you know, if I'm, an if I'm imagining, for example, um, running the annual Rock, Paper, Scissors World Championship, which is a real thing, um, it attracts about um, 100 teams every year. Um, the winning team um, for many, many, many years was a program called uh, Iocane Powder. One person has seen Princess Bride. Good. If you haven't seen The Princess Bride, go see The Princess Bride. Um, so uh, the idea is, is, well, I don't want to talk about rock, paper, scissors, but you've got 100, 150 teams, and the fourth is within the reach of something you can do on your phone. Um, but if you look at a typical you know, programming contest run by CM online, it's got a few thousand teams. And the fourth is not so not so great then. Okay. Then I guess you have to hope that the head-to-head -head contests are not actually going to be every single pair, but something sparser. Okay. So again, the general idea is uh, in order to figure out whether um, a team is mathematically eliminated, um, I need to assign future games to winners. And I need to do this in a way that, if possible, um, assigns fewer total wins to every other team than the one that I want to win. And if that's possible, then my team is not mathemat mathematically eliminated. And if there's not, um, then it is. This picture, by the way, did not show up in, um, uh, you know, on ESPN. They didn't draw the graph and say, look, there's a cut. <laughs> um, but you can bet that someone in the Major League Baseball office is charged with drawing these graphs every time somebody wins a baseball game. OK, any questions? Right. All right. So let me describe um, a slightly different example now. So I'm going to draw a uh, directed acyclic graph. And um, I know that at this point, as soon as you hear me say, oh, it's a directed acyclic graph, um, what's the first thing that you want to do to it? Topological sort. Um, it's not really going to help. <laughs> In this particular case, uh, it doesn't really um, uh, gain you anything. So I want to imagine that um, I have a collection of jobs that it is possible for me to do. I can be hired to do these things that will pay me a certain amount of money. Um, but some of these jobs, I would have to buy equipment. I would have to spend time taking an algorithms class to be trained to, to do this. And so some of the tasks that are available for me to perform don't actually give me a profit, but rather I have to pay for them. 
So I'm going to model this by, um, eventually I'm going to build a graph, but for now the vertices are the jobs that are available to me. And I'm going to assign each of these jobs a positive weight if taking that job earns me a profit. And a negative weight if taking that job means I have to pay something. All right, so the weight on, all, on any vertex is the net gain and money that I get. And what I'd like to do is choose a subset of these jobs to do that maximizes the, the total profit I can get. Right, so obviously, um, the way that I phrase the problem, I take all the ones that pay me, I ignore all the ones that I have to pay for, and, and we're done. Okay, this is sort of the, the, the naive ideal, um, except that I haven't told you everything that goes into the problem. Um, I also have some precedence constraints between these things. So, um, before I... Uh, do the job that will pay me, you know, four thousand dollars. I have to do something that will cost me two thousand okay. dollars. And so, um, as a general pattern here, um, I have a graph that encodes um, jobs that I have to do before other jobs. Okay, so um, I'm given a DAG, G equals V times E. Um, I want to select a subset of the vertices, let's call that subset S, so that if V is in S, then u is in s for all edges from u to v. Right? So if I decide, for example, that I'm going to take this job in the lower left corner that will pay me $4,000, I must take the job at the top left and the job next to it that cost me a total of $5,000. And so uh, the goal, of course, is to um, maximize the, 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 the total profit, keeping in mind that negative edges subtract from that profit. Okay. Now, to kind of give the game away in some sense, um, I've actually given you a fairly big hint in naming this subset of vertices capital S. Right. Um, the other jobs that uh, I'm going to ignore or throw out, let me call those vertices T. Right. Um, so the task that's that I need to solve is somehow to partition the vertices in two sets subject to some constraints. And because this is a class about applications of maximum flow, um, it's a reasonable guess that somehow I need to transform this into a minimum pot problem. I need the partition, I need to somehow put capacities on these edges and maybe possibly on some other things so that the minimizing the capacity of, an, of a cut corresponds to maximizing my profit. Okay. So any um, any suggestions for how I might do that? Well, you'll notice one thing that this graph doesn't have. Actually, two things this graph doesn't have. It doesn't have a source and a target. I mean, it, it in fact has three graphs that you might think of as sources and, and or 
three three verb nodes that look like sources and three nodes that look like sinks, but I have no sort of canonical um, source and target vertices. So um, I'm just going to add uh, a source and a target. Um, and because I want to select jobs that pay me money and throw out jobs that don't pay me money, um, I'm going to put S down here on the profitable side and T up here on the, on the expensive side. Now, in general, um, this particular graph is, has a nice property that the, the profitable vertices and the costly vertices line up nicely in these two rows and all the edges go down. That's not going to be true in general. Much, much more complicated graphs for the, where the, the solution I'm going to describe will work. Now, somewhere here I'm going to uh, um, define a cut between S and T, but I need to enforce the condition that if I choose any vertex to be in S, then every one of its predecessors must also be in S. Um, maybe how I might do that. Yeah. Combine the nodes in what way? Um, so that Well, okay, so you might think, um, if I'm going to do this job that, 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 that pays six, then I also have to pick this job that costs three, so why not merge these together into something that costs only three? Well, but then do I merge this into both of them? And, you know, uh, it, it's not clear exactly how to make that work out. Yeah? Um, so the definition of a cut is just Partition the vertices. The definition of the cost of a cut is pay for every edge that crosses from S, the S side to the T side. So, how, how, infinite what? Sorry. Right. Right. So I want to I want to put in edges with infinite capacity that. Because they have infinite capacity, they can't be in any minimum cut. And so effectively that means I'm ruling them out as being it's possible to separate them. Um, so for every pair of edges that have this precedence relation, I need to put in an edge going the wrong way. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna reverse. Um, so fine. I'm going to reverse all these edges. All right, so now the, uh, the edges don't point from before to after, but point the, the opposite direction, the sort of unnatural direction. And I'm going to give every one of these edges um, infinite capacity. Okay, and the idea is that if then later um, I try to separate off um, a subset of, of vertices without including their predecessors, the cost of this cut will be infinite. Okay. Good. But, all right, so that enforces the precedence constraints, but somehow I also need to put edges from S into the rest of the graph and, and from the rest of the graph into T so that um, the capacity of a cut corresponds to the somehow to the profit that I can make. Um, and again, I've kind of given you a hint by putting S down here and putting T up there. Um, so um, the way this works is I'm going to put um, edges from S to every profitable vertex. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, 
<laughs> right. So the, the capacity of this edge is going to be the, the, the profit from the from the from the job that it's pointing to. For and you know, I want to be I want to be suggest, suggestive here about profit. Um, and then I'm going to have um, an edge going from every costly job to the target where the capacity is the loss, is the cost. Okay? Um, and now uh, let me look at a particular cut in this graph. Okay, so I'm just going to pick out... <coughs> This cut. Okay, so um, I'm going to select these six jobs, um, and I want to reason about the capacity of the cut versus the 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 the, the total profit. Actually. So remember that the the naive goal, if you weren't thinking about the precedence constraints at all, would be to accept all of the profitable jobs and throw the rest on the floor. Right, so at some level, if we're trying to maximize profit, we're trying to minimize the distance between the amount of money we can make and the total sum of this naive choice. Okay, so what's the gap? We, we can't quite make $15,000, but what's the difference? So for every profitable job that's on the wrong side of the cut, there's an edge from S to that job that crosses the cut going forward. So this capacity reflects lost income. On the other hand, up here where I have this costly job, if I have a costly job on the, on the selected side of the cut, I have uh, an edge whose capacity is the cost of that job leaving, you know, crossing the cut again in the, in the right direction. So, whereas here, this edge represented lost income, this edge crossing the cut at the top also, in some sense, represents lost income. It's, a, it's an expense that I wasn't expecting. So, the total amount of money I lose compared to the naive answer is equal to the number, of the, the cost of the profitable nodes on the throat that I throw away minus the, uh, or sorry, plus the profit, or minus the cost of the, the, the costly edges, the, the costly jobs that I actually have to choose. And so this means that, that, that my total profit is actually the sum of all the positive nodes minus the capacity of the cut. So if I want to maximize my profit, that means I want to minimize the capacity. Okay, so the, uh, let's say this, All right, so for any cut, the, the, the capacity of that cut is equal to the sum of all the, the positive costs um, uh, how do I say this? Um, Sorry. Right, okay. So the, 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 the capacity of the cut is equal to sum of all the, the positive costs um, minus the actual profit. So if I'm going to maximize actual profit, that's the same as minimizing um, the cost of the cut. So, interestingly, we don't need to compute the flow at all, right? So, um, I mean, there's a, there, there is an interesting asymmetry between computing maximum flows and computing minimum cuts. If you compute a maximum flow, then you automatically get a minimum cut out of it. You just build the residual graph, and then you say, within the residual graph, what can I reach from S? That, that, that will be the S side. Um, in this case, though, maybe we could, there might be just a way to compute the minimum cut 
Uh, notice that when we know the minimum cut, we can't necessarily infer a maximum flow from it. We know the value of the maximum flow. We just don't know what the flow value is on an individual areas. Um, and under some circumstances, um, in particular, um, when the graph is planar, it is actually easier to compute just the minimum cut without computing flow values. Yeah? What algorithm do you use to compute the Ford Fulkerson or Lin's algorithm. I mean, it, it, in, in general graphs, I actually don't know whether it's easier to compute minimum cuts than it is to compute maximum flows. Yeah. There, it, there's no principal reason why they really, one, one, one requires the other. Um, it, it's, maybe there's a faster algorithm, algorithm to compute minimum cuts. We just, for general graphs, we don't know of such an algorithm. So, um, if you find one, come back and see me about an A+. Yeah. <laughs> and a PhD. <laughs> Um, okay. Question. Yeah. Um, I don't. So the question was, how do I make sure the minimum cut is unique? And the answer is, it doesn't matter. Any minimum cut is going to give me the same, is going to represent the same profit. No matter, you know, if there are three minimum cuts, there are three possible sets of jobs that will all give me the maximum profit, and I just pick one arbitrarily. Okay. All right, so I want to do one more example. Um, and this one also involves a DAG and also doesn't involve topological sort. Um, so um, let me just draw um, a simple DAG here. Just eight nodes ought to be enough. So um, I've got multiple sources. Um, multiple sinks. Okay, this this looks like a reasonable DAG. Um, okay. So, um, I'm going to make up a totally fake story to give some intuition about what the problem is. Um, so the idea is um, every source in this DAG you should imagine as being um, uh, you know, a warehouse where, um, uh, you know, the Postal Service keeps its mail trucks or Amazon keeps its planes or something like that. Um, and uh, the, uh, you know, every mail truck, say, is going to go start at some source and it's going to follow some path in this bag until it reaches the sink. Um, or maybe I have, um, you know, uh, just, uh, let me do that in a different color. Maybe um, I, I establish warehouses in places that aren't sources. I just have possible locations that um, I might want to establish a warehouse, either as a place where trucks can leave from or a place their trucks can, um, can go to. Um, so maybe this is the kind of thing that I'm looking for. Let me see if I can make that a little darker. Um, and so what I would like to find is a collection of paths that can start anywhere in the bag. They can end anywhere in the bag. Um, and the condition that I want these paths to satisfy is that every vertex belongs to at least one of them. Okay. In this particular example, um, in fact, uh, every vertex belongs to exactly one of, these, one of these paths, but that's not necessarily going to be the best thing to do all the time. So given um, a DAG G, um, I want to find the minimum number of paths uh, that cover all vertices. 
Okay? So, I mean, maybe I can imagine that these are, you know, physical things moving through, um, you know, going from airport to airport with an airplane, or maybe these are uh, jobs that need to be executed. This, this pattern of jobs is going to be executed on one computer. That pattern of jobs is going to be executed on another computer. And precedence constraints are just, this job has to be completed before that one. But um, I want each computer to just follow a line um, through the, the, the dependency DAG. Um, now, I, I, I really do need the input graph to be a DAG. Because if there, are, is there, if there is a potential for cycles in this graph, or if the graph is undirected, um, this problem becomes NP-hard. Now, I don't know, you know how much you remember from 374 about NP-hardness, but let's sort of zoom ahead um, a month or so into the course. Um, why, in, if I just replace the word DAG with a graph, can anyone tell me why this problem might be hard? Yeah. Right. So think about, the, if in particular, if I can find the minimum number of paths, then I can answer the following question. Is there a single path that touches every vertex? And this is the Hamiltonian path problem. It's one of the canonical examples of NP-hard problems. We'll, we'll see... If you haven't, didn't see the reduction in 374, we'll, we'll, we'll see it again. But it's essentially like a, an easy version of the traveling salesman problem, which is hopefully everybody's heard of. Okay. So it, it's actually very, very important that, that the graph is, is a DAG. Otherwise, the problem becomes impossible to solve um, um, efficiently. Um, but strangely, it's not still there's not going to be any topological sort involved. Okay. So um, we're used to thinking about you know flows as sums of paths. And so you might imagine that there's a flow problem buried in here, even if you weren't in a class about applications of maximum flows. Uh, but it's a bit strange because normally we think about maximizing something about flows, and here I'm trying to minimize something about flows. Um, on the other hand, um, I'm used to thinking about flows in terms of upper bounds, um, um, capacity constraints. Only so much flow can go through a particular, particular edge. Whereas if I think of these paths as somehow components of a flow, this constraint covering all the vertices this is saying I need at least one path to go through every vertex. Um, and so that, that symmetry between I want to maximize subject to some upper bounds versus I want to minimize subject to some lower bounds maybe provide some evidence, some, some intuition that, that, yeah, max flows, if we can just figure out how to turn max flows upside down, um, that might actually be the way to go. Okay. So um, think of this as I want to flow uh, such that the uh, flow into each vertex is at least one. Right. This is sort of the maybe the, the intuition that we uh, that we want if I stand here. Okay. Um, okay. But you'll notice that the, the, again the thing that this graph doesn't have. It doesn't have a source, it doesn't have a sink. Okay. Um, the other thing that's weird is that I, I have something that resembles a backwards capacity constraint, but it's attached to the vertices and not to the edges. So I'm gonna, I need to do a couple of things to um, convert the problem to maximum flow. Okay, so I'm gonna define, um, you know, to solve this problem, I'm gonna define 
uh, uh, a new graph um, H. Okay. So um, H is going to have a source and a target, and roughly speaking, it's going to have a copy of G here in the middle. And S is going to have uh, an edge going to every vertex in G, and an edge coming out of every vertex in G, joining it to the source and the target. So every vertex in the original graph is going to be, a, is going to be attached to both S and T. <coughs> okay. All right, that establishes a, a global source and a global target, where we might imagine now flow going through this graph. Um, in particular, um, if I have, uh, you know, two vertices S and W inside here, um, a single flow path from S to T is going to show up in the original graph as a path from V to W. It sort of enters the graph from the sky, meaning from S, um, and it sort of enter, you know, exits the graph into some synonym for sky that gives with T. Okay. Um, so as far as G is concerned, I just have a path. Okay, good. So I've kind of made the paths look like a flow at this point. Okay, the, the next thing I need to do is somehow deal with the fact that I have constraints on the vertices instead of constraints on the edges. So I'm going to do exactly what I did for the vertex disjoint path problem. I'm going to take the vertices and I'm going to split them. So every vertex is actually going to become two vertices now. Um, one with, uh, um, uh, with all incoming vertices, all, all incoming edges, and the other one emitting all outgoing edges. So there's the in, and there's the out. Um, here's another vertex. Here's W in, here's W out. All right, and I have edges going like this. The source goes to V in, V out goes to W in, W out goes to T. Um, S also is going to W in, V out is also going to T. And now these vertical edges um, are the things that have constraints on them. I want at least one unit of flow to go through each of these vertical edges. Okay. Um, for the moment, let me not think quite yet about how to reflect, and I want the minimum number of, of, of paths. Let me just think about what a, a path cover might look like at this point. Um, so I'm going to have some flow that goes from S down and over to the in, to the out, to W in, down to W out, and then over to T. Okay. Again, given a path in the flow, I can map it back to a path in the original bag, G. Like this just, I have an edge going from V out to V in in this path, so that's going to be reflected by an edge from V to W in the original graph. Okay. All right. Now, Let's think a little bit about the way Ford and Fulkerson's algorithm works. Intuitively, you can jump into the middle of the algorithm, and what you're doing is saying, um, look, I have a flow. It's feasible, meaning it meets all the balance constraints. It meets all the capacity constraints. The flow is non-negative everywhere. OK, great. I'll just start from here, build the residual graph, try to push more flow through. And I'll do that over and over again until I get stuck. That, that's Ford Fulkerson. Um, now, when we normally think about Ford Fulkerson, the, the initial feasible flow that we start with is every edge has flow zero. And because um, you know, the lower bound that we put on the flow is zero everywhere, the zero flow is feasible. It's a, it's a solution. It's not the optimal solution, but at least it's a valid solution to finding a flow from S to T. I can't do that here. The zero flow isn't feasible here. But what I can imagine doing instead is finding a feasible flow 
and then improving it by looking for augmenting patterns, just like in the portfolio. Okay, so find in terms of the original problem, find a cover of the DAG by paths. And then by doing something that might resemble looking at residual graphs, um, improve that cover by reducing the number of paths, one at a time. Okay? So the first thing that I'd like to do is find a feasible, um, uh, you know, so this is, this, is my, this is my graph H. Can I find any feasible flow in H? Now, the only constraints on the flow being feasible are that at every edge, the flow must be non-negative, except at those vertical edges that, that I grew inside my vertices, where the flow has to be at least one. There are no upper bounds on the flow. There are no capacities. Can somebody think of a feasible flow? I mean, I've shown you one feasible flow in this in this particular um, example, but um, remember that there are going to be you know other vertices lying around. Um, X in, X out, um, and each of these is going to have a constraint. Uh, of a, at least one unit of flow, and each of these is going to have a, an edge coming in from S and an edge going out to T, and possibly some other edges going out, possibly some other edges coming in. Yeah. Right, right. So, what were you going to say? Yeah. So, like, just a path model, you have to see every year. Right. So, I just take these paths that go S to U in to U out to T for every vertex U in the original graph. Yes. No, uh, so in this particular case, I, in order to define what a feasible flow is, I need to establish a constraint on something that, that forces the flow to go through that node. If I just write down a graph and say, find me a feasible flow, I say, great, zero. Yeah, but in this case, I have no upper bound. So the maximum flow is infinity everywhere which is just as difficult to work with. I mean, I could probably do it, but um, uh, this particular initial solution has some um, additional structure that, that, that's very attractive, right? So um, let me uh, you know, erase this, this green path here and, you know, so I'm gonna start with just these, you know, my, my initial flow is, is really just trivial, right? I go from S to U in, to U out, and then to T. In this I didn't say I had to go through any edge. I said I had to go through every vertex. And I do go through every vertex. So this corresponds to a path cover of the original graph by n paths, each of length zero. The path is start the truck here and don't move it. Right? Okay. So um, this this as I said this corresponds to um, n, or I, I guess I should say um, v paths of length zero. In fact, this is the maximum path cover of the DAG. You can't, I mean, without using the same vertex more than once. Okay. So 
Great. Um, I've computed a flow which intuitively corresponds to a really awful path cover. And somehow now I want to imagine improving this. And the way that I want to improve this is to somehow push less flow. Right? Notice that the number of units of flow that I'm pushing through the graph, h, is equal to the number of paths in the corresponding path cover. Here I have a flow with value v, in this case v is 4, um, but I can kind of see if I squint at it that um, there's a simpler path going from s to v into v up to w into w up to t. So I can reduce the flow and still have a path cover. The question is, how much can I reduce the flow? I want to reduce the flow as much as possible. I want to maximize something. Namely, given that I've already sent this flow forward, how much flow can I send backwards to undo that without violating any of my constraints? Okay. Um, and so, this leads me to, uh, you know, um, uh, another graph I'm going to call H prime. Okay, I'm still going to have a source. I'm still going to have um, uh, these pairs of vertices. Um, and I'm still going to have a sink. But now the way that I use the, 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 the edges is, um, is going to be a little bit different. Essentially what I'm thinking about is trying to commute something that resembles a residual graph for this flow that I've computed in H. Now um, what, I, what I want to think about, you know, here's U in, here's U out. Um, v in, V out, and again, I have edges going like this, W in, W out, X in, X out. But now I have a residual edge going backwards from every in vertex to S, reflecting the fact that I can undo one unit of flow back to the source. Right. Um, similarly, I have uh, an edge going from the target node in H to every out vertex in G. Right? Um, right. So I'm going to draw, I'm not going to draw all of these, but I'm going to draw just a few. Um, and now uh, I need to put some kind of constraint on these vertical edges. But the constraint on the vertical edges is actually kind of trivial. I, you know, normally when I put a unit of flow going downwards, I, that would mean in the residual graph I'd have one unit of residual capacity going up. But I don't want to put that unit of residual capacity going up. I don't want to undo that one unit of flow. That one unit of flow has to be there forever. It's perfectly fine if I send more than one unit of flow through this edge. That just means in the path cover I have two paths that go through the same vertex. That, that's okay. Right? So in fact, I'm not going to have any constraint on this edge. It's just going to be, I can send any non-negative amount of flow through these vertical edges. And similarly, for any edge that is inherited from the original graph G, um, I have any amount of flow that I could send um, through uh, any, any non-negative amount of flow I can send through that edge. And now notice that once again I have um, a graph that has only integer capacities and now they're all upper bounds. Namely I've got upper bounds and the edges coming out of T and I've got upper bounds and the edges coming out of S um, and all the flow values need to be non-negative. There are no constraints here in the middle. Um, now, 
This is a residual graph in some sense of the, of the flow that we computed up there. It's saying how much flow can we undo? Um, and so at this point, I can look for residual paths, but not from S to T, but rather from T to S. Right? So um, and in the end, what I'm going to be look, doing for is now I'm going to compute um, a, a maximum flow from T to S in this, this residual-ish graph H comp. So in particular, if I use Ford Fulkerson for this, I'm going to be computing some sort of uh, augmenting path. Um, hopefully, everyone can see an augmenting path in this DAG. Let me make it green. It will show up. So I can, for example, go like this. That is an augmenting path in this DAG. And what it corresponds to um, compared to the original, the, the original example at the top of the screen, is instead of having this green path and this blue path separately, I should go from S to V in to V out to W in to W out and then to T. And so the edge from S to W in is going to carry one less unit of flow. The edge from V out to T is going to carry one less unit of flow. And the edge from V out to W in is going to carry one more unit of flow. Right. Um, and at this point, we're basically done. Okay. So I set up a flow that's too big. And then I turn the residual graph on its head, and I compute a maximum flow in what's left to bring the, the, the flow value down. Um, and as long, and what I'm going to end up with is um, a flow that obeys the original capacity constraints that I set up there at the top of the screen. Um, that has, you know, maximum value if I think of it as a flow in H prime, or the same way as saying I, I'm going to end up minimizing v minus the number of flow, the, the flow value that I undo. Okay. So in a sense, this is like the previous problem where I'm selecting jobs. In order to maximize one quantity, I want to minimize a constant minus that quantity. In this case, the constant is v. So if I want to um, minimize the number of paths, I should maximize v minus the number of paths, which is going to be the value of the flow that I get here. Okay. So in the end, um, the minimum number of paths covering G is going to be equal to V minus the max flow value in H prime. Not, no, so, so um, the question is, why did we bother to go through this, this flow analogy instead of just thinking in terms of the original graph and saying, to start with a bunch of like zero paths and then greedily try to improve this by, by gluing in edges? Yes, the algorithm that you just described is equivalent to this. And the way I discover the algorithm that you just described is I do this and then I say, what would it look like if I mirrored what how the behavior for Fulkerson here back in the original graph? And the answer is whenever I do, you know, augment a path here, that's, that's going to correspond to doing something in the original graph G. It's not actually going to be just pick out an edge and add it. It's going to be a little bit more complicated than that because now that I've pushed the unit of flow through this edge, in the next residual graph, I'm going to have one unit of capacity going backwards, and that actually sets up the possibility of removing some edges and moving them somewhere else. And so it's a little bit more complicated than just gluing an edges greedily until I, 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 I can't anymore. 
But it is possible, and, and really, if you're going to implement this, you want to retranslate this back into the language of the original. Any other questions? Okay. Nothing in the homework is this complicated. Thank you. Hey. Sure, sure. Um, if you like. Um, I mean, it's not